more, please? This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Uh, Anita Morose from ITT. All right, what's your number? 201-330-5173. I'm returning his call, and he can reach me between 8.30 and 4.30 tomorrow. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello? Hello, this is Arginius Evendale. This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Oh, <laughs> this is Arginius. All right, what's your number? 758-0615. Thanks. Anything else? Yes. Uh, I'll have an answer to the name of the hotel by tonight at 8 o'clock. I have somebody calling me from Houston. All right. Anything else? No, that's all. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. 429. Hello? Hi. I'm calling for um, Evan Moore. This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Um, this is Gina. All right, what's your number? Uh, 733-3343. Thanks. Anything else? No. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. 610. This is George, my invention of 1981. It was fully up and running in the fall of 81, although it didn't sound that good because I didn't have a proper analog-to-digital converter. Initially, I had to record the outgoing announcements in a kludgy way using the Apple's cassette input. The feature of calling the time and recording that on the tape was added in 1983, as was the higher quality outgoing announcements. But the overall algorithm to appropriately respond to callers and get them to leave their name and number was there from the beginning. Here's the way it sounded in 1981. This is the computer speaking. I decided to use the term answering machine instead of computer when I re-recorded the phrases. Here's 1983. This is the answering machine. That's how it sounded on the incoming message tape, which did have some extra distortion. Here it is over long distance. This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Now some more from 1983. Hello? Evan Moore, please. This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Jeff McDonald. All right, what's your number? 458-4927. Thanks. Anything else? No, sir. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Hello? Can I speak with Evan Moore, please? This is the answering machine. Hi. Who's calling, please? Uh, this is Dr. Finkel's office. All right, what's your number? Four four nine three seven four four. Thanks. Anything else? To calling to remind me as an appointment Monday at twelve noon. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Nine forty five. Now, how do you do that and have it work that well with nineteen eighty one technology? Go ahead. In nineteen eighty one. No one even had voicemail yet except for a few experimental voicemail subscribers in Philadelphia. And no one had an answering machine like this, except me. There was something, though, that was out there that actually inspired this to some degree. Are you servicing a 1050, 2740, or 41-type terminal? No. Are you servicing a BiSync device? No. I think normally it'll work Repeat. for you. Please say distinctly, yes or no. Right, that invention. Please repeat, answer yes or no. Shut up. Anyway, that invention did understand yes, no, and digits. George, however, did not try to understand speech. It was listening intently, however, dynamically timing the caller's talk bursts to decide what to say and how fast to come back and say it. Each prompt had its own dynamically adjustable response time. So, for example, at the hello prompt, hello. George, once it detected some speech, was all set to come back with, This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Fairly quickly, making it sound natural. However, if the caller talked past a certain amount of time on the hello prompt, George would go into a different mode, assuming the caller intended to leave a complete message 
right at the first prompt. At that point, George would no longer attempt to sound natural and would instead allow the caller to pause long periods of time before finally coming back and assuring the caller that if he wanted to record more, he could. Here's my friend Steve demonstrating this feature for someone. Hello? Oh, crap. It's that answering machine again. God, I hope it doesn't put me through all that rigmarole with all the questions and all that stuff. I mean, all I want to do is just say that it's Steve and Evan. When you hear this, please call me, okay? This is the answering machine. I'm recording your message. Go ahead. Well, that's refreshing. I'm glad it's not so difficult. I guess that's really all. No, let's see. Wait a minute. Actually, there is something else I want to do. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so I want to add on a different number. There, he was demonstrating the remote feature where a four-digit code... That password is too weak. Oh, come on. It's 1983. Get off my back. Anyway, there were remote features such as using the three-way calling, recording a voice memo, etc. that could be done, all initially accessed with a super secure four-digit code. Hello? Hi there. This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? It's me, calling long distance. All right, what's your number? Hi there. Hi. Uh, I'm out of town at the moment. Well, I play with the phones. Yeah, I do. Oh, all right. Anyway, the code for my machine right now is 9083. Okay. Thought I'd let you know if you're, you know, if you need to use it. And what do I do for the it's, for, uh, for it, transfer? Uh, for transfer, when the call is in progress, you quickly go pound star. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. Well, let me run. Okay. See you later. Bye. Good afternoon. Bank South is happy to add time weather temperature to its community services. Bank time two fifty two. The Atlanta area weather cloudy today. Drizzle and little temperature change tonight. Temperature sixty one. Well, enough of remote use of my computer. Back to the dynamic response time. As I said, each prompt had its own parameters. One thing that I had to accommodate was that sometimes people would leave a seven-digit number like this. All right, what's your number? Five 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 two three six eight. Thanks. Anything else? And at other times. All right, what's your number? Five 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 two three six eight. Thanks. Anything else? In order to sound natural under either case, and God forbid, not cut someone off after they've only given three digits, George would accommodate that potential long pause in the delivery of a phone number by starting out with a long response time and then after the caller had blah 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 enough to have gone beyond the first three digits it would cut back the response time so that no matter how the number was spoken it would come back with a very reasonable sounding thanks anything else and no unnatural long pause in practice with my calls this feature worked perfectly but unfortunately, I did not keep my incoming message tapes. However, there was a wrong number caller who did demonstrate this feature, albeit unintentionally. Notice how on the OK What's Your Number prompt, a very long time passes between her first talk burst and her second. But George comes back very quickly after the second talk burst. Just imagine that she's leaving a phone number. All right, what's your number? What? Who's this? Thanks. Anything else? Perfect. It waited a real long time after the central office code. What? 
But when she gave the last four digits, it came back with natural timing. Post this. Thanks. Anything else? See? Hello? Where the fuck are you? This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? I know. I didn't make a reservation, so I can't expect to be able to reach you. Bye. 735. The feature of recording the time after each message was added in 1983 using the George technology. After finishing with the caller, George would turn off the tape and call up the Weathercron time number, notice when Fred Covington started talking, and then wait for the appropriate pause in his speech to turn on the tape recorder just to record the hours and the minutes. Good afternoon. Speech detected. Is your new Xerox copier a piece of junk? Call 455-8550. The present temperature is 34 degrees. Eastern Standard Time. Tape on. 1227. Tape off. Piece of junk. Hey. The 1983 version of George also did call waiting. When a call waiting beep was detected, while George was already talking to someone, it would politely wait for a pause in the person's speech and then say, I have another call. Can you hold, please? It would then wait for something that had the rhythm of OK, and then it would say thanks and go get the other call. To the second caller, it would answer hello, allow him to say something, and at an appropriate pause, it would say, this is the answering machine. I'm on another call. Can you hold, please? Again, it would wait for an acknowledgement, say thanks, and go back to the first caller, I think saying, I'm back, and continuing where it left off. Then it would go to the second caller, and if he or she was still there, finish that call. There was no provision for being a demon multitasker, a la John Erickson's answering service in New York. That's Shelley, and your telephone number? 247. 247, just a sec. Good afternoon, may I help you? Hi, this is Maria. Do uh, I any messages? Let me check for you, 247. But I thought about it. And I have to admit, that answering service was also an inspiration for this invention. The only surviving recording of George doing anything with call waiting was a prank call when someone called me up and made some noise with a teletype, old-fashioned typewriter, or adding machine. In what follows, George detects the call waiting beep, then politely waits for a pause in the clattering before saying, I have another call, can you hold please? Had the noise not been so continuous after George asked the person to hold on, it would have worked. But unfortunately, the clattering was so continuous that George took that as a sign to abandon that call. Hello? This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Another call. Can you hold, please? Knowing that a living person goes blah blah blah, not blah. Right, that's what that looked like. George abandoned that call and took the other one as a fresh call. Can't play that one for you because the tape is just in too bad shape. That call and others have come from a tape that was literally reused, and fortunately I was able to reclaim what was recorded on it originally. It ain't easy. Here's Steve demonstrating to a friend that the prompts of George can be very persistent. While this is not a realistic use of the machine, it does show what it's like to navigate around the prompt logic. Hello? Hello? Hi. This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Who's calling, please? Hello? Oh, damn. Okay. All right, all right. It's Steve. Who's calling, please? Well, I said it's Steve. All right. What's your number? Hello? All right. 4413232. Thanks. Anything else? No. Okay, thanks. I don't like talking to answering machines. Bye. Uh, no, wait, don't go yet. Damn. Boy, this thing's insulting, I'm telling you what. I guess I'm going to leave a message. All right, so tell Evan that Steve called, and, and it's now mm, 6-11, and we're getting ready to go out to Sunny's and have some barbecue, so I'll call him back later. I hope that's all right with you. All right. Anything else? No. 
Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Six twelve. While I'm the only designer on this project, I did not write the program. Clay and I thought this would be better in 6502 assembly language, and he was better at that than I was, so he wrote the program according to my specs. I remember that he made a very elegant little table for me so that I could change the way you would navigate through the prompts as well as any of the timing parameters. If, for example, I heard this happening too many times... Who's calling, please? Hello? Oh, damn. Okay. All right, all right. It's Steve. Who's calling, please? Well, I said it's Steve. I could go into that elegant little table and change it so that this would happen. Who's calling, please? Hello? Oh, damn. Okay. All right, all right. It's Steve. All right. What's your number? I didn't have it that way because, as far as I could tell from watching the thing, the few callers who were hesitant to respond did need to be reprompted at that point, but I could have changed it. Thanks to Clay's making the program so neat and elegant, it was easy for me to tweak everything to near perfection. And frankly, there really wasn't that much that needed to be changed, just a few things here and there. As an example, in the earliest incarnation of George, the prompt that it gave when someone left a very long message on the hello to tell them to continue recording if they liked turned out to be inappropriate, so I changed it. Here, Les takes advantage of the feature and then comments on the inappropriate prompt at the end. Forgive me, but I'm going to have a little fun with Les's incoming message. This particular splice-up was done around 1982. George work? Yes. Beautifully. However, sometimes, especially with wrong numbers, people would just refuse to believe that they were speaking to a machine. Hello? Uh, hello, this is Tris McFadden. I'm with Telebusiness Supply. I wonder, sir, if you could tell me uh, what kind of typewriter you use in your business, or do you use one? This is the computer speaking. If there's anything else you want to tell me, say it now. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. Hey, you? Computer? Bye-bye now. You too. Uh, n nice way to get rid of a salesman, although I'm not interested would work too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Hello? Hello, can I speak to Robert? This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? What? All right, what's your number? What? Who's this? 
something else? <laughs> no, it's somebody saying this is the answer, right? Can I help you? What is your name? I said, what? Well, can I have your number? I said, who is this? Thanks for calling. I'm just <laughs> Hello? Hello? All right. Anything else? Is he saying, all right, anything else? Okay, thanks. Wait a minute, hello? I'd like to speak to Robin. All right, anything else? Yeah. Hold on, all right? Okay, thanks. Bye. Wait, no, no bye. Hold on, okay? <laughs> all right, anything else? Hello? Hello? Okay, thanks. Hello? Hello? All right. Anything else? That's all you say. Can I speak to Robin? Can I speak to Robin? Okay, thanks. It said, okay, thanks. Bye. That ain't no real history. 923. Such a great idea, right? You would think that this would have been marketed. Well, we were trying. Specifically, my friend Steve was trying. He knew it was a great idea, and it was amazing the apathetic response that we were getting from anyone who was in a position to do anything about it. Steve would sometimes add on my line and let George record the conversation that he was having. Here's an excerpt of one of those voice memos that I just happened to have. It'll give you an idea of what Steve was trying to do and what he'd been through trying to do it. All right, to give you a quick idea of what we want to do, our idea is to continue to use standard magnetic tape as the message recording medium. Okay. And I think it's fairly obvious. The technology to make it cost-effective to use the hard disk for incoming messages when you've got essentially a Vox recording scheme and they right. could talk forever, it just ain't practical. That's true. And people who think they're going to sell a make a fortune selling a message call and forward system in a store and forward system using a hard disk or an IBM or I think full of shit as a Christmas turkey yeah, is right. not cost effective to tie up $3,000 worth of hardware for 20 seconds worth of speech. Yeah. So I, I'm at this point it looks like it makes sense to me to use micro cassette and one of our big headaches is we've got to find an OEM source of a micro cassette or a cassette mechanism with Actually, a deck, not just a not just a transport, but a deck. Unless we want to manufacture our own analog electronics ourselves, sure. which I just soon not do. I just yeah. soon farm as much of this out, you know, as possible. Yeah, especially in that type of uh, mechanism, there's just no way that you can meet the low cost. Exactly. Of OEMing, uh, and there's enough suppliers of that type of. Uh, but what about with solenoid control? What we want essentially is a dictaphone type mechanism that, upon contact closure, it either rewinds, fast forwards, records, or plays. No contact closure. Of course, it's in a stop mode. With that bear a little bit of research, but I don't think that you have any difficulty finding it. All right, right. we've got to find it at a low price. Uh, what we eventually want to do with this, Steve, what we want to get it to is an RS-232 uh, interfaced outboard box about the size of, say, Hayes' uh, chronograph that was a flop. But something small, sexy. Since it's going to have to have a clock chip on it, we may as well put a you know, a display on the front of it that indicates the time and shows you the status that the device is in sure. on the front panel. And, uh, you know, a few lights that do something to make it sexy, make it sleek looking, have the cassette or micro cassette in it, and then just have it RS-232 at 19.2 kilobaud to, uh, and my target market for this is, is present PC owners, and the lines I want to go after specifically in this order are be only because I've got it developed first, because I think it's a smaller market than the IBM PC market, and I see our target market as small businesses and very upwardly mobile home PC owners who are, you know, technologically oriented, yeah. who probably work in high-tech industry. I don't think this is going to be everybody's got to have one. Yeah. But I do think all small businesses might buy them, and I think that a lot of people who work out of their home you know, that kind of thing will definitely want. I think there's an enormous market. I just don't have my hand on, on any really, really good demographic research regarding yeah, the target market. That would be one of my questions. Uh, it sounds like a good idea to, obviously, you and to, so far, I'm favorably impressed as well. But have you performed any kind of market research so far? No. To, let me handle that question with you right now. At this point, what we're searching, obviously, for is not only 
hardware hackers and some software hackers, but funding. I've gone through ATDC, and they came up cold because at this point, Steve, the entrepreneurial element is missing. I do not have a commitment to master what is necessary to be the CEO of this company. Uh -huh. I'm just not interested. Yeah. I'm interested in turning that over to someone else. That's fine. What but are they asking for? What they want is either a, uh, a coherent business plan, which there are a thousand questions on the Arthur Young Company suggested outline for a new high technology business plan <laughs> that I can't answer. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. I wondered about that uh, ATDC announcement, <laughs> how they were going to go about doing their, their thing. They have, they have uh, uh, it's just a debacle. You'd have to talk with Evan to appreciate it because I'm so on it about them that I'm, when I tell you about it, all you hear is my emotional taint with them. <laughs> but they have consistently behaved contrary to their stated purpose for being. Yeah. Uh, I, I had an interview with Mark Swecker and with uh, the head of it, Jerry Birchfield. Jerry couldn't see why anybody would want one. That was his reason for no enthusiasm. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, upon research, some other people said, well, there all, is already plenty of what you're talking about doing out there on the market. So all the reasons they haven't supported us are complete bullshit reasons. They've missed the point. Yeah. Now, of course, I'm responsible for communicating the opportunity, and obviously I haven't done that very well. But uh, the other thing is we sat down and talked with High Chinkas that used to run Crown Camera. Yeah. And uh, High, of course, is now retired and was, is with SCORE, the yeah. core of retired executives. Thing, you know that oh, uh -huh. you know that's consultants, and he basically said, without either the CEO or a coherent business plan, I can't attract venture capital. And he said we might talk to someone like Ron White or someone like that that you know is is doing some real out on a limb speculative stuff. But you know I'm to the point of negotiating with Dennis Hayes and selling this thing to him just outright if necessary. I want to see it come to fruition as a product. Yeah. Uh, we have a marketing approach. We have, I think, in marketing terms. That's yeah. sort of my special distinctive competence. Right. And we've come up with what I think is a great name that we're in the process of trademarking. We're going to call it George mm -hmm. because there is no distinctive acronym or descriptive phrase that outlines all the things it'll do. There just isn't. So we're going to uh, play up the human attribute aspect and simply call it George. Okay. Let me go ahead and drop off Evan's dictation machine here because I'm using up his tape. Hold on a minute. Actually, George was my name for this device, but it was a good marketing name, too. I chose the name George because there was a ridiculous character that I'd been playing on the Atlanta conferences whose name was George, and I decided to name this after him since George on the conference was my alter ego. The name George turned out to be such a good idea that within three or four years there was a high-tech company that came out with some computer-related telephone device, and they called it George. It didn't do interactive answering machine, though. In 1983, there was no end in sight for George. But that changed. Now, in 1984, George actually began to announce with Pat Fleet's voice instead of mine. Now, I didn't keep my incoming message tapes, and so these are the only surviving recordings of Pat Fleet being the voice of George. You'll have to strain your ears to hear under my babbling the sound of George operating with Pat Fleet's voice. 180 dial 0 up to 189 dial 9. 190, just hold on. 191. So, uh, that's the case. 2.12, to save time in the future, please enter your preference digit immediately after dialing your account code. 2.13, you have changed your call please. preference. 2.14, we'll call you back and connect you to the party line momentarily. 2.15, excuse me, payment for your account is now past due. Please remember, payment is due before the first of each month. All accounts unpaid as of the sixth. Please accept our thanks if you've already mailed your payment. This one's in two parts, A and B. 216, in order to be connected, please remember to dial 9. Okay, 222 thanks. is not a valid preference code. Bye. You'd think that having Pat Fleet on George would be good news. And in a way it was. But why did we call in Pat Fleet for a session? It was because we had a new business coming. By 1983, George was running using a telephone interface board that could decode touch tones and provide good audio coupling. That board, which could handle only one phone line, was $500. That's $1982 for one phone line.
Now in fall of 1984, when the business went from experimental and free to commercial, that was when that $500 board for the Apple II needed to go into the business. And that was the end of George. But there was also another reason, a technical one, that George could not have continued in its existing form through the 1980s. And it had to do with the fact that George listened to the phone line using the Apple cassette input. The cassette input was designed for loading programs for cassette tape, and the only thing the cassette input could detect was zero crossings. Therefore, it allowed George to hear the phone line, but only in terms of sound or no sound. There was no ability to detect relative levels of anything. There was no way to distinguish between blah 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 and background noise. Now the good news for the early days of George is that everyone, and I do mean everyone, was using a telephone with a carbon mic. If you go back and listen to all of the recordings of people using George that are in this program, every one of those people is calling from a carbon mic telephone be it Princess, 500 set, 2500 set, Trimline, they all have carbon mics. Now around 1982-83, new telephones, not made by the Bell system, began to come onto the network. These new telephones didn't have carbon mics. They had condenser mics, or something like it. And while the voice quality was better, there was a major technical drawback, which I don't think anyone realized at the time. As soon as these new telephones came onto the network, something changed. You could no longer talk on the phone while washing the dishes without the person you're talking to knowing that you were washing the dishes. You see, Mr. Gray's invention of the variable resistance transducer, which became the Bell System's carbon mic, had a wonderful side effect. Despite the fact that it gave a distorted sound, it automatically filtered out background noise. If I were talking on a carbon mic right now, you wouldn't have heard that car in the background. Nor would you hear the room echo of the place I'm recording in. That's what I'm talking about. Carbon mics wouldn't let you hear that. Because this isn't a carbon mic, I have to use the computer to do what a carbon mic would do and reduce the room echo and most of the cars going by. The difference between a carbon mic and a condenser mic was huge as far as George was concerned. Had George continued to run through the second half of the 1980s, there would have been more and more instances when George just seemed to have gone away, lost in his thoughts. Actually, George would be hearing background noise in the caller's environment that the caller hadn't even thought about, and that's why it wouldn't come back and respond. Here's how it is with a carbon mic. All right, what's your number? 555-2368. Thanks. Anything else? Now with a condenser mic, it's like this. All right, what's your number? 555-2368. Hello? Are you still there? Thanks. Anything else? Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit there, but that was the problem. The newer telephones made the background noise so loud that George couldn't tell the difference between it and speech, and so it totally messed up the timing. So a complete technical redesign on the listening part would have to be done to tell the difference between background noise and speech. And Steve and I didn't have time for that. We started a new business that wasn't related to George, but did involve telephone lines. Meanwhile, I got a great new disco job around the time that our business came online, and so George kind of disappeared from our consciousness. We had other things to do. There's one more anecdote that I want to share, and I'm sorry that it's an anecdote. I could kick myself for not saving this recording because it would have become a classic. During the last days of George, when Pat Fleet was the voice of George, I got a call from Pat Fleet. Though I don't have the tape, I do remember exactly how it went. Hello? Hello? Is Evan there? This is the answering machine. Who's calling, please? Well, it's Pat Trumbull. All right, what's your number? 255-2368. Thanks. Anything else? No, but it's really weird talking to myself like this. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. 
Well, you've heard all the recoverable, surviving tapes of George that I've got. That's it. There are more of our exploits from the early 80s, including the beginnings of that business, coming up in following episodes. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye now. Speak normally, it'll work for you.